Hello and welcome to episode 21 of the Idiot Book Nook podcast. I'm Blazewing and my pronouns are she, her, and they, them. I am the Reading Dragon and my pronouns are she, her. I'm Lady Punnett and my pronouns are she, her, sometimes they, them. Is today a she, her they, a day or a they, them day? Mm, I think it's a she, her day. Cool. Cool. Susceptible to change. Cool. As it does. We are bringing you the Bartimaeus Trilogy, or at least the first book in the Bartimaeus Trilogy, The Amulet of Samarkand. We are going to be starting off today with Chapter 5, but before we do that, <clears throat> we have some social media stuff to discuss. Yeah. If you would like to follow us on our social media um you can do so. Uh, you can find Lady Punnett at linktr dot e e slash Paulina dot Avalon. You can find myself on Linktree at linktr dot e e slash Blazewing two zero one zero, and you can find the Reading Dragon on Linktree at linktr dot e e slash the Reading Dragon. If you would like to take a look at our podcast feed and or leave us a voice message for the podcast that we can play in a viewer and a listener feedback episode you can find us on anchor.fm slash idiot dash book dash nook and if you would like to take a look at our beautiful website you can do so at idiotbooknook.wordpress.com Woo. Woo. so with that being said i believe we are starting off on chapter five of the amulet of samarkand and i believe we have our narrator here this morning so, narrator, if you would please. I'm excited to see what happens. Yes. <clears throat> <coughs> the Bartimaeus Trilogy, Book 1, The Amulet of Samarkand, by Jonathan Stroud. Narrated by the Reading Dragon, voice acted by Blazewing2010 and Lady Punnett. Chapter 5, Nathaniel. Above all, said his master, there is one fact that we must drive into your wretched little skull now, so that you never afterward forget. Can you guess what that fact is? No, sir. No, sir. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. You, you can take that one. Okay. No, sir. The boy said. No. The bristling eyebrow shot up in mock surprise. Mesmerized. The boy watched them disappear under the hanging white thatch of hair. There, almost coyly, they remained just out of sight for a moment, before suddenly descending with a terrible finality and weight. No. Well, then. The magician bent forward in his chair. I shall tell you. With a slow, deliberate motion, he placed his hands together so that the fingertips formed a steepled arch, which he pointed at the boy. Remember this, he said in a soft voice. Demons are very wicked. They will hurt you if they can. Do you understand this? The boy was still watching the eyebrows. He could not wrench his gaze away from them. Now they were furrowed sternly downward, two sharp arrowheads meeting. They moved with a quite remarkable agility, up, down, tilting, arching, sometimes together, sometimes singly. With their parody of independent life, they exerted a strange fascination on the boy. Besides, he found studying them in he found studying them infinitely preferable to meeting his master's gaze. The magician coughed dangerously. Do you understand? Oh, yes, sir. Well, now, you say yes, and I'm sure that you mean yes, and yet... One eyebrow inched skyward musingly. And yet I do not feel convinced that you really, truly understand. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, I do, sir. Demons are wicked and they are hurtful and they will hurt you if you let them, sir. 
The boy fidgeted anxiously on his cushion. He was eager to prove that he had been listening well. Outside, the summer sun was beating on the grass and the hot pavement. An ice cream van had passed merrily under the window five minutes before, but only a bright rim of pure daylight skirted the heavy red curtains of the magician's room. The air within was stuffy and thick. The boy wished for the lesson to be over, to be allowed to go. I have listened very carefully, sir, he said. The master, his master nodded. Have you ever seen a demon? He asked. No, sir. I mean, only in books. Stand up. The boy stood quickly, one foot almost slipping on his cushion. He waited awkwardly, hands at his sides. His master indicated a door behind him with a casual finger. You know what's through there? Your study, sir. Good. Go down the steps and cross the room. At the far end, you'll find my desk. On the desk is a box. In the box is a pair of spectacles. Put them on and come back to me. Got that? Yes, sir. Very well, then. Off you go. Under his master's watchful eye, the boy crossed to the door, which was made of a dark, unpainted wood with many whorls and grains. He had to struggle to turn the heavy brass knob, but the coolness of its touch pleased him. The boy swung open soundlessly. Oh, sorry. The door swung open soundlessly on oiled hinges, and the boy stepped through to find himself at the top of a carpeted staircase. The walls were elegantly papered with a flowery pattern. A small window halfway down let in a friendly stream of sunlight. The boy descended carefully, one step at a time. The silence and sunlight reassured him and quelled some of his fears. Never having been beyond this point before, he had nothing but nursery stories to furnish his ideas of what might be waiting in his master's study. Terrible images of stuffed crocodiles and bottled eyeballs sprang garishly into his mind. Furiously, he drove them out again. He would not be afraid. At the foot of the staircase was another door, similar to the first, but smaller than, but smaller and decorated in its center with a five-sided star painted in red. The boy turned the knob and pushed. The door opened reluctantly, sticking on the thick carpet. When the gap was wide enough, the boy passed through the boy passed through into the study. Unconsciously, he had held his breath as he entered. Now he let it out again, almost with a sense of disappointment. It was all so ordinary. A long room lined with books on either side. At the far end of a great wooden desk with a padded leather chair sat behind it. Pens on the table, a few papers, an old computer, a small metal box. The window beyond looked out toward a horse chestnut tree adorned with the full splendor of summer. The light in the room had a sweet greenish tint. <coughs> the boy made for the table. Halfway there, he stopped and looked behind him. Nothing. Yet he'd had the strangest feeling. For some reason, the slightly open door, though which he had entered only a moment before, now gave him an unsettled sensation. He wished that he had thought to close it after him. He shook his head. No need. He was going back through it in a matter of seconds. Four hasty steps took him to the edge of the table. He looked around again. Surely there had been a noise. The room was empty. The boy listened as intently as a rabbit in a covert. No, there was nothing to hear except faint sounds of distant traffic. Wide-eyed, breathing hard, the boy turned to the table. The metal box glinted in the sun. 
he reached for it across the leather surface of the desk. This was not strictly necessary. He could have walked around to the other side of the desk and picked up the box easily. But somehow, he wanted to save time, grab what he'd come for, and get out. He leaned over the table and stretched out his hand, but the box remained obstinately just out of reach. The boy rocked forward, swung his fingertips out wildly. They missed the box, but his flailing arm knocked over a small pot of pens. The pens sprayed across the leather. The boy felt a bead of sweat trickle under his arm. Frantically, he began to collect up the pens and stuff them back into the pot. There was a throaty chuckle right behind him in the room. He wheeled around, stifling his yell, but there was nothing there. For a moment, the boy remained leaning with his back against the desk, paralyzed with fear. Then something reserted itself in him. Forget the pens, it seemed to say. The box is what you came for. Slowly, imperceptibly, mm, imperceptibly, he began to inch his way around the side of the desk, his back to the window, his eyes on the room. Something tapped the window urgently three times. He spun around. Nothing there. Only the horse chestnut beyond the garden, waving gently in the summer breeze. Nothing there. At that moment, one of the pens he had spilled rolled off the desk onto the carpet. It made no sound, but he caught sight of it out of the corner of his eye. Another pen, another pen began to rock back and forth, first slowly, then faster and faster. Suddenly, it spun away, bounced off the base of the computer and dropped over the edge onto the floor. Another did the same, then another. Suddenly, all the pens were rolling in several directions at once, accelerating off the edges of the desk, colliding, falling, landing, lying still. The boy watched. The last one fell. He did not move. Something laughed softly right in his ear. With a cry, he lashed out with his left arm, but made no contact. The, moment the momentum of his swing turned him around to face the desk. The box was directly in front of him. He snatched it up and dropped it instantly. The metal had been sitting in the sun and its heat seared his palm. The box struck the desktop and lost its lid. A pair of horned rim of horn no, a pair of horn rimmed spectacles fell out. A moment later, he had them in his hand and was running for the door. Something came behind him. He heard it hopping at its at his back. He was almost at the door. He could see the stairs beyond that led up to his master. And the door slammed shut. The boy wrenched at the doorknob, beat at the wood, hammered, called to his master with a, no a choking sob, but all to no avail. Something was whispering in his ear, and he could not hear the words. In mortal panic, he kicked at the door, succeeding only in jarring his toe through his small black boot. He turned, he turned then, and faced the empty room. Small rustlings sounded all around. Sorry, let me start that again. Small rustlings sounded all about him, delicate tap, delicate taps, and little flitterings, as if the carpet, the books the shelves, even the ceiling, were being brushed against by invisible, moving things. One of the light shades above his head swung slightly in a non-existent breeze. Through his tears, through his terror, the boy found words to speak. Stop! He shouted. Be gone! 
The rustling, tapping, and flittering stopped dead. The light shades swing sl- the light shade swing slowed, diminished, and came to a halt. The room was very still. Gulping for breath, the boy waited with his back against the door, watching the room. Not a sound came. Then he remembered the spectacles that he was still holding in his hand. Out of the cleaning fog of fear, he recalled that his master had told them to put them on before returning. Perhaps if he did so, the door would open and he would be allowed to climb the stairs to safety. With trembling fingers, he raised the spectacles and put them on, and saw the truth about the study. A hundred small demons filled every inch of the space in front of him. They were stacked one on top of the other all over the room, like seeds in a melon or nuts in a bag, with feet squishing faces and elbows jabbed into bellies. So tightly were they clustered that the very carpet was blocked out. Leering obscenely, they squatted on the desk, hung from the lights and bookcases, and hovered in midair. Some balanced on the protruding noses of others, or were suspended from their limbs. A few had huge bodies with heads the size of oranges. Several displayed the reverse. There were tails and wings and horns and warps and extra hands. <clears throat> and extra hands. Mouths, feet, and eyes. There were too many scales and too much hair and other things in impossible places. Some had beaks, others had suckers, most had teeth. They were very conceivable... Mm. They were every conceivable color, often in inappropriate combinations, and they were all doing their best to keep very, very still, so as to convince the boy that nobody was there. They were trying extremely hard to remain frozen, despite the repressed shaking and trembling of tails and wings, and the uncontrollable twitching of their extremely mobile mouths. But at the very moment the boy put on the spectacles and saw them, they realized that he could see them too. Then, with a cry of glee, they leaped at him. The boy screamed, fell back against the door and sideways onto the floor. He raised his hands to protect himself, dashing the spectacles from his nose. Blindly, he rolled over onto his face and curled himself up into a ball, smothered by the terrible noise of wings and scales and small sharp claws on top, around, beside him. The boy was still there, twenty minutes later, when his master came to fetch him and dismiss the company of imps. He was carried to his room. For a day and a night, he did not eat. For a further week, he remained mute and unresponsive. But at length, he regained his speech and was able to resume his studies. His master never referred to the incident again, but he was satisfied with the outcome of the lesson. With the well of hate and fear that had been dug for his apprentice in that sunny room, this was one of Nathaniel's earliest experiences. He did not speak of it to anyone, but the shadow of it never left his heart. He was six years old at the time. And thus ends chapter five. So first of all, this Dick. is a flashback. Yep. Second. Dick. We'll get Fucking to that. asshole. We'll get to mm -hmm. that. Second, <clears throat> he was six. Yeah. That is how you give a child PTSD. I get that this book may be aged a bit. Mm -hmm. But that's how you give a child PTSD and lifelong psychological issues. Yep. Third, dick. Yep. Dick. <laughs> dick. 
So, yeah, this is one of the reasons why the boy who summoned Bartimaeus is, and the master, if I, well, I'm, well, we'll get to that later, but yeah, no, this is pretty much Nathaniel. We are now being introduced to the name of the boy who uh, summoned Bartimaeus. Um, so Dick. At the, yes. At the beginning, fucking Dick. At the beginning of this chapter, I just want to pay yeah. tribute to a moment, to a, for a moment, to a slip of the tongue. The boy mm. opened soundlessly. I love that. Can you stop attacking me? That I'm is trying hilarious. to multitask. <laughs> Got it. Uh, so join the circus. Second. Pretty obvious. I know I'm Captain Obvious here, but the master set the boy off. Or set the boy up, rather, when he sent him into the uh, into the study. Rude. Fucking rude. Yeah. I get that there was a lesson that needed to be taught, but fucking rude. Yeah. It's not really clear from what I remember when this story takes place. Mm -hmm. But I imagine it's somewhere between, like, the 80s to whenever this book came out, originally. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the other thing that I noticed that I have in my notes here, the imps, the demons... Mm -hmm. They were absolute, utter dicks to this kid. Yeah. However, that being said, it needs to be noted. They weren't trying to cause actual harm, which means they were following instructions, which means they are intelligent and they are probably in service of his master, which yep. means he's either formed a contract with them or they are friends. Yep. And demons in general are kind of assholes anyway. Yep. There is... A thing called lawful evil for a reason. I have another point to make also. Um, they mentioned something about an old computer. So mm -hmm. that means this is actually sometime in at least the uh, 1980s? Mm -hmm. well, they 1990s? Also, they mm -hmm. also mentioned an ice cream van as well, which means, yeah, our setting is modern day. Mm-hmm. Now, ice cream trucks and ice cream, well, anything, has been around since, like, I think the 20s? Yes. So, I, I understand that. But where I grew up and mm -hmm. where I spent my teen years, we didn't have ice cream vans or trucks. We had the ice cream Stop bicycles. It. The the freezers mm -hmm. on the bicycles. I actually yeah. drove one of those for a summer. It was not, not pleasant. Um, yeah. But... We didn't have the trucks and the vans until my later teen years. We're talking like late 90s. Mm -hmm. Which my is area, we didn't really have them because of my town. At least I don't recall seeing any of them. I think I, I don't remember. I'd have to look at that uh, documentary again. But I think when it came to like the ice cream vans and trucks, they started in my home state of California. Or... Um, I think one started in California mm -hmm. and around the same time there was one in like New York or something like that. I don't remember. But two people kind of had the same idea unknowingly. So when I say modern day, I mean like 70s, 80s, 90s. Like we're, we're talking more recent eras, mm -hmm. uh, more recent decades as opposed to the early 1900s or, you know, the 1800s. The late like where I first thought that maybe this was might have taken place because yeah. the whole like ye old tongue the boy was using yeah yeah which um in a lot of uh, magic practices and whatnot you kind of have to use older language. I am absolutely intrigued with this book so far. Um, mm hmm. I don't do nearly as much reading as I used to. Um, like, I used to be an avid reader. Also, don't mind me. I'm just setting up a mannequin head. Like, I am an avid... I, I used to be an avid reader. you give me a book and my nose would be stuck in a book for hours. Same. Mm -hmm. um, it used to be the way to entertain me. Used to be the way to... Stop. Get off. 
It's like, we have a cat on the keyboard. <laughs> Just give us a second. Sorry. <laughs> I'm good. sorry. He's you're good. being very pesky today. You're good. You're good. Don't worry about it. I used to be an avid reader. It used to be the way to entertain me in cars, right? And it used to be, you know, you want to keep me quiet for hours on end? Give me a book. If I like it, I'll sink into it for hours. Um, and then as time went on, I apparently stopped reading and I really need to get back into that habit. And this tells me why, because my it actually exercises my imagination. It gives me that kind of creative spark and it allows me to sink into other worlds and I've forgotten my love of that. So it's something I might actually have to take up here. Um, I might be doing something over on our Twitch uh, every once in a while where I just sit down and read a book. So I don't know. What else did we pick up about this chapter? Uh, this is probably the first time he ever uh, had any sort of real experience with demons, Nathaniel. Fair. The master's a dick. Yeah. Can you stop? His master is absolutely a dick. 100%. Oh, yeah. Um. I'm not sure I like the guy. Because I mean, the master or the kid? The master. Because, like, he's a. F from the impression that I get, he's a mm -hmm. fully grown adult. Like, he's been yep. studying this shit for years. And yeah, yep. he has an apprentice and he has a job to do. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you have to traumatize the kid. Yeah, it'll leave an impression, but you're going to have. It's like I said earlier, you're going to have massive psychological issues later on down the line that, that are going to need to be dealt with in order to have a well adjusted person. Yep. Wish I knew what that was like. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sorry, a little too close to home. <laughs> but at the same time, like, I'm enjoying kind of the different layers, the different aspects, and I'm enjoying the magical component to this. It's a whole new universe for me to explore that I don't know anything about. Ye. Another, I, so I'm going to make it, so I doubt Blue can answer this because she's read the book, but I want to make an infer, inferring on something. So Nathaniel is six years old and it sounds like he's living with his master because he yep. said he was brought to his room. Yeah. Yep. That so, was actually a common thing. Like in the most uh, magical lore, it is common for an apprentice to live with their master. Well, yeah. But I want to make an infer about something that, uh... So there's two possible ways you can... Three, actually, technically. So either... He's an orphan. Mm -hmm. So he was picked up by this guy. Mm -hmm. He's also possibly uh, his parents gave him mm -hmm. to this guy in hopes he would better his life. Because mm -hmm. here's the thing. I would like, I know there's a lot of shitty parents out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like to think any half decent parents wouldn't give this man a child not unless they had some sort of uh soul binding contract or yeah and just stay with me here from what i understand in a lot of older stories in a lot of the i want to say the old days or foregone times you know we're talking medieval times which is where a lot of this sorcery and magic and fantasy initially take root from it is not un it was not uncommon to hear of apprentices actually living with their masters and not seeing their family for years on end in order to properly learn their trade. And I wanna mm. say that's a throwback to that, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. Mm. And again, there is also the possibility, especially because we are in a more modern setting, there is probably some kind of contract made between the yes. parents and the boy's master. Yes. And that it, the parents probably couldn't ha couldn't get out of. I was going to say, in this world, it, it would probably stand to reason, at least from the five chapters that we've seen thus far, that that would then be a mag uh, contract, you know, reinforced by magical means. Which means mm -hmm. if they break the contract, there will be magical consequences, and those are things that they cannot avoid. Yep. And depending on the severity of the consequence... 
Well, I mean, look at a look at a certain book series, um, the Harry Potter book series, um, with mm -hmm. um, was it Snape and Narcissus? I think it was in book six. Yeah, they had to make some sort the of like uh, the unbreakable they, vow. If if yep. one end is broken, if somebody breaks that unbreakable vow and Renege is on their uh, on their the deal that they made, they die. Yep. And those are consequences that you cannot escape. Nope. So, what else we got? Um, so when I was reading the description of how the demons were looked and placed and whatnot, and the mm -hmm. descriptions of the demons, yeah, it gave me the mental image of something out of a uh, uh, Robert Faust book. Robert Faust. Yeah, Robert Faust. Okay. Yeah, I don't. So, I've never read any of Robert Faust's books, so I'm oh, blind. No, uh, Robert Faust is an illustrator, and oh. I think he did a couple fairy tale stories. But his artwork was utilized for uh, things like uh, the Dark Crystal mm. uh, Labyrinth. So well, all of that whimsical Jim Henson movies, yeah. like the the fantasy films that were so popular that are also now kind of cult classics all that artwork all of the um concept art for that that is the that is robert faust and his family so just touching on jim henson for a sec and um by far and, and large uh, you know in a wider aspect storytellers themselves you have your generic artists, right? Like you have the people, mm -hmm. you have what you think of as traditional art, which is paintings or drawings or the people who can put a picture on some sort of surface, whether that's electronic or, you know, physical paper or parchment or whatever, and they can draw mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful scenes. Mm -hmm. What a lot of people don't realize is that art isn't just images. It's crafting. It's the written word. And there are people out there who can paint a world with words just as well as an artist can so you can actually visualize it in your head which is mm -hmm. actually my preferred style of writing yep and you are and we're seeing that a lot more as the dungeons and dragons community is growing exponentially yes. especially with uh cr with groups like um uh who uh what what's that group not critical role but um Acquisitions Incorporated. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Lady Punnett, weren't you watching a couple of podcasts or anything like that? Or, was this, or aren't you aware of a couple others? So there are a few others. One I can think of is uh, Dice Karma Actions, which mm -hmm. I don't think they're continuing due to a slight scandal that happened uh, with them. Uh, let's see, there is not so much a Dungeons & Dragons campaign, but there was an L.A. by Night Mm -hmm. campaign which yep. was done with vampire the masquerade tabletop which game i really mm -hmm. want to get into vampire the masquerade i mm -hmm. you, whether that's as a storyteller or you know as a player but mm -hmm. i i have an experience with vtn that also left a bad taste in my mouth same yeah but. it'd be fun to get back into at one point though absolutely 100 percent. so do we have anything else we want to talk about points Nothing from this I can novel think or... off the top of my head for this Simply mm -hmm. because it's, we we got a lot of things that we've already covered, which was he has a hatred of demons now, which is understandable because yep. trauma. Yep. And those were imps. Imps yeah. are like the lowest rank demon. Mm-hmm. Yep, they, they can't are. Uh, do a lot of damage. In a lot of mm -hmm. wars they are anyways. Mm-hmm. So... The master, sadly, knew what he was doing. Mm-hmm. As much and as made I, sure. As much as I don't want to admit it, you fucking dick. Yeah. All right. So perhaps we should wrap this episode up then. Do our outro and uh, yeah. What do you guys think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, at least for the podcast episode and then just go on our little regular break yeah, for that's, yeah. that's that's what i that's sorry that's what i meant because yeah. this is going to be released i was trying to format the the speech more towards the podcast aspect with the understanding that the people on twitch would understand what i meant yeah cool 
Just in case the Twitch folks here are not aware, <laughs> we normally just keep going yep. and we just take breaks in between chapters. Yep. So that way we have a place to cut into yep. when editing this in the podcast format. Yep. So mm -hmm. we want to thank you very much for joining us for episode 21 of the uh, Amulet of Samarkand, the first book in the Bartimaeus trilogy. Mm -hmm. This is going to be, one second, I was going to say something. Sorry, chapter five and episode, uh, chapter five of the book and episode 21 of the podcast. Um, if you'd like to reach us on social media, you can find myself at linktr.ee slash blazewing2010. You can find The Reading Dragon on Linktree at linktr.ee slash the Reading Dragon, and you can find Lady Punnett on Linktree at linktr.ee slash paulina.avalon. The links will all be in the show notes for this episode. You can also, if you would like to check out our podcast feed, feel free to do that. And you can also leave us voice messages over in Anchor uh, at anchor.fm slash idiot-book-nook. And if we get any feedback, we may do a listener feedback episode, which would be kind of cool to do. And if you would like to check out our beautiful website, you can do so at idiotbooknook.wordpress.com. We would really appreciate your questions, comments, fan art, whatever. Absolutely. Communications. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that goes for anybody here in the Twitch chat as well. You are more than welcome to utilize any of those resources. But that being said, for episode 21 and chapter 5 of the Idiot Book Nook podcast slash the Amulet of Samarkand, I'm Blazewing. And I am the Reading Dragon. I'm Lady Punnett. And we want to thank you very much for joining us. See you in episode 22.